It's time for another episode of the Ranking of Naruto Games! The show where I play, review, and rank every Naruto game out there. Good news, everybody! We've got a little over 10 games to go before we finish this series. Bad news, though, today we're going back to the series that's been consistently the worst in the Ranking of Naruto Games. That's right, today we're diving back into Ninja Council, but at the same time, I'm excited to see what they did with the Uzumaki Chronicles series. It's not called Chronicles anymore, and it's on the PSP instead of the PS2, but it's basically a sequel to Chronicles. I actually play through most of this game live on twitch.tv slash globku. I stream every weekday, so if you guys would like to join me and see me stream, I mean, I'll be fighting that day Dara boss fight from Clash of Ninja Revolution 3 on stream, and that's probably the next video, so now would be a good time to follow me on Twitch. But without further ado, here is Naruto Shippuden Ninja Council 4, which is technically Ninja Council 5. Ah, <sighs> the Ninja Council games are complicated. Ninja Council 4 was technically Ninja Council 2 European version that we reviewed a couple of episodes ago. But here with the title game Ninja Council 4, which is kind of Ninja Council 5. It's confusing. I'll just call it Ninja Council 4 from now on. The game did improve a lot, especially considering Ninja Council 3 was the game that broke me and sits quietly at the bottom of this ranking for now. Ninja Council 4 keeps a lot of the previous game DNA, but now you play with Shippuden characters and you actually play through the Naruto Shippuden story until the Sasori fight. I would actually say that for the first time in this series, there's actually a significant difference between playing different characters. Previously, they all just play the same, but had different special moves. This time, they all still fight the same same, but not only do they have different specials, each character also has a unique ability. For instance, Naruto can summon Gamabunta and jump into high places where other characters cannot get to. Kakashi summons Spakun, who pushes buttons out of reach. Lee's movement is far superior to anyone else's, he jumps really high. Neji can use Byakugan to mark the map with items and collectibles, so there's an actual reason to play with different characters instead of just it being an aesthetic change. Picking different assists can also be useful, though most of them just deal damage when you need to, with the exception of Sakura, who can actually heal you, and that makes her probably the best assist in the game. Along with that single improvement, there are also a bunch of others that really impressed me. For instance, you now have a new uppercut move by pressing up and the attack button with every character. That's really a godsend for flying enemies. Running and jumping attacks got a massive buff, which makes defeating enemies a lot faster if you know what you're doing. And I really like those changes, but at the same time, they also removed the block button. So now you can't just block regular attacks and wait for a punish, you actually gotta jump to dodge around stuff. It's not like the block button was overpowered or anything, most boss moves were already unblockable, so it's kind of a weird choice. And I think the previous game was also a bit more bold in trying new concepts for different levels, like a Sasuke snowboarding level, for instance. This one doesn't really have those kinds of gimmicks, because each level is designed to be replayed with each character. So they didn't get too crazy with any of them, which makes all the levels kind of play the same. Also, probably for the first time in the series, the map is actually useful. It actually shows the level, giving you a sense of space beyond the tiny screen. It's super basic, but it took them five games to finally get there. That said, the incentive to explore and replay these levels with different characters still isn't there. You can collect the leaves, which are the currency you spend to upgrade your characters between levels, you basically buy new jutsu and new support characters, and sometimes you get an extra life, so you start from the last checkpoint instead of replaying the whole level. That's it, no collectibles, no unlockables, nothing really. And the currency is actually separate, meaning if you collect something with Naruto, you can only use it to upgrade Naruto, so if at some point you wanted to try a new character, you're gonna have to start playing them with a single jutsu, which kind of discouraged me from swapping characters since the levels do generally get harder as they go. Difficulty wise, this isn't nearly as hard as Ninja Council 2 European, that Orochimaru boss fight is still probably the hardest boss fight I've played in this series, which is not to say that this game doesn't have a ton of cheap stuff, touching enemies still knocks you down, wall jumping can still be awkward because of the specific angles it requires, and that they dart a level, man that they dart a level. Imagine platforming while explosives are falling from the sky, except the screen is too small to see them coming, so you just randomly get hit all the way back down. Regarding boss fights, there are some unique fights here, but a lot of them are still the same uninteresting one-on-one -on -one fights without a lot of gimmicks. In that regard, I don't think a single Ninja Council game has done it better than the first one. And finally, it wouldn't be a Ninja Council without some really silliness in animation and music. For instance, we got the Kakashi dance that all the kids are talking about. Mm. Mm. Yeah, dance Kakashi. If you're not a fan of that, maybe you'd like to check out the Garashimi. It matches the music and everything. And speaking of music, no track in this game is able to beat the legendary composition 12 from Ninja Council 2, but there are definitely some gems. Especially the soundtrack from the last level, where it feels like they just threw a bunch of instruments together and started slapping them at random. 
This is a 20 second loop that plays throughout the entire level. In conclusion, I like all the quality of life changes, the map, the new uppercut, giving characters unique abilities, but I feel like the game also lost some stuff. Namely, those unique levels we had previously, and a lot of unique boss fights just aren't there. It's mostly a one-on-one -on -one battle that you use the same formula to win every time. It's a very similar game to Ninja Council 2 European, though I would say it's slightly worse. So we're going to place it right below that. It is another D rank game. We got a lot of those for sure. Let's see if the next game will be better or worse than that. <sighs> Had to dress up for this one because it is time for Naruto Shippuden colon Legends colon Akatsuki Rising. It's a third-person action game that builds on the foundation of the Uzumaki Chronicles games on PlayStation 2. And since it's now Naruto Shippuden, you could kind of call it a sequel. This time it doesn't tell an original story, it unfortunately does not feature the master puppet. <laughs> It tells the Naruto Shippuden story, from the start until you rescue Gara, so pretty much the same as Ninja Council 4. Comparing this to Uzumaki Chronicles 2, the game is missing so many features. First of all, there's only one attack button, they removed the strong attack, so combos are much simpler, and that's a shame because I kinda liked the combo system before. It felt like I could get creative, and now it just feels like I mash and do special moves, and in boss fights I'm just exploiting some weakness, that's how you actually beat this game. Exploit the crap out of something and play super cheap, and it also helps feels much worse than previously. There's a stiffness to the movement and attack animations that just feels wrong. And your enemies move around so much that it can be easy for you to misjudge if an attack is gonna hit or not, because most of them have deceptively short range and your momentum isn't really carried into the attack. So the whole thing feels pretty damn terrible. At the start of any mission, you can pick any character to play that mission, which can also lead to some disconnected moments within the story. For instance, you pick Neji as your character, and then you have this cutscene where Naruto runs into Itachi in the story and gets trapped in his genjutsu, you guys remember that? So, for Naruto to escape the genjutsu, it cuts the gameplay and it's Neji fighting? That's a weird way to retell the story. You can also pick two other party members that won't become assists or anything, they just give you some stat buffs and they take a cut of your XP, because once again, each character has separate experience points, they all level up separately as you play them, which to me is discouraging, like I don't want to swap characters if I'm gonna have to level them up all the way from level 1 to whatever level I'm at. I'll just play played my highest level character, otherwise it's just a grind. And I'm okay with grinding once in a while, but the problem is, the missions, they're all pretty much the same. They are so, so bland. First, you usually walk around these hubs, so, hmm, some Konoha exploration, you go into the sand, you go into the forest, okay, that seems fun. Around these hubs, you'll find enemies and treasure chests. These chests can include items like shuriken, which are consumables, you can actually run out of thrown weapons, and once in a while, they also include jutsu, which is pretty much the only incentive to exploring these areas. Thing is, the best way to collect jutsu is to find a single treasure chest next to a save point and just farm that same chest over and over until you get the jutsu you want. So really, even though these are semi-open areas, there's really no incentive to explore. And whenever they decide to get more creative with their mission design, somehow they make it worse. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to the worst mission I've ever played in a Naruto game. Retake the tower. There are two towers and the mission tells you that bandits have taken them over. You need to go to both towers and kick their ass. So I head to the North Tower, running across the desert. And this is not exactly a small walk. I reach the North Tower and there's Iruka. He says that the tower is closed, you need to start with the other one. What? Why? Why wasn't I briefed on- Why did I just travel across the desert? So you gotta backtrack the whole desert you just traveled, take a different path that is just as long and make it into the South Tower. The South Tower has six floors full of enemies. Defeating them all, one by one, by the time you reach floor 5, you will see this lever. You don't know what it does, but you pull it anyway. Get to floor 6, and the door is closed. Uh oh. That means the lever that I just pulled did not open this door. Which means it probably opened the door to the other tower in the north. The game doesn't tell you this, you have to figure it out. And by the way, if you didn't kill every enemy in these six floors, the game won't let you leave the tower. Again, without telling you why you're stuck. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been stuck in this mission. So you run across the desert again. The north tower is now open. Congratulations, here are four more floors full of enemies. Did I mention how much I hate combat in this game yet? Get to the fourth floor and oh, there's another lever. Let's pull it. Nothing happens. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Run across the desert once more to the south tower. Make your way up to the sixth 
sixth floor. Thank God enemies did not respawn. Turns out the door on the sixth floor gives you direct access to the north tower. I don't understand why I have to run across the entire desert when the two towers are actually connected to each other. This game doesn't make sense. Anyway, there are a bunch of bees in this floor and you defeat them. Mission over. I guarantee you no one play tested this mission and said, ah, yes, this is a good one. Retake the tower will be a highlight of our game. And as you travel through these different areas during these side missions, you may have noticed that enemies have different levels in different zones. This is, after all, an RPG. But it can be so wildly random. For instance, you can be walking in Konoha, surrounded by level 7 bandits, and out of nowhere, here's a level 30 bird. Why? I have finished this game. I still don't know why that bird is there. And don't get me started on the centipedes. Gosh, the centipede. There's an early mission that wants you to kill centipedes. They're level 20, which is pretty high for an early mission, but on top of that, they are absolute sponges. They have so much health. And they keep going underground, which makes killing them super annoying. And also they kill you in two hits. This whole RPG system is very poorly built. The difficulty is all over the place. There's no steady difficulty ramp. It's nothing but spikes. I do like the upgrade system a bit. Not as much as the board from Uzumaki Chronicles, where you would fit the jutsu, but it is fine. You can level up each jutsu individually. You can unequip and equip the jutsu you want. And if you have any leftover space, you can fill it up with attack, defense, or chakra bonuses. It's all right. Outside of that, uh, what else is there? Oh, the cutscenes. We've played games on PSP that have looked all right. This one was very ambitious with 3D cutscenes and they are so poorly animated. I'm talking Jump Force levels of poor animation. This Shadow Clone Jutsu Rasengan is such a great example. Faces have absolutely zero expression. I don't know what goes through their heads when choosing a soundtrack for most of these cutscenes. Like, here's the scene where Naruto learns that Gara is dead after rescuing him from the Akatsuki. And you tell me if you think this is the right song to play during this sad moment. <laughs> Uh oh, there goes Naruto vibrating again. The best thing I can say about these cutscenes is when they are not telling the main story and you're just doing side missions, the writing is pretty good. It's a bunch of jokes usually centered around Tsunade and a few of them actually made me laugh out loud. It's very good humor. And all the cutscenes are voice acted as well, which includes the side missions. And in side missions, you can still pick any character you want, which means they have actually recorded voices for all playable characters for every mission. And that's definitely praiseworthy, but that's also really all I can praise. It feels like a very complete game. There's a ton of post-game content that you unlock with Yakatsuki after the game is done. It feels like a full product, but it's a bad one because what you unlock is more dull missions and this combat just feels bad. So it doesn't matter how much there is because I don't want to play any of it. This won't be a D-rank game because it's a bad game. At least it has a lot of content, so we're going to rank it at the top of E. But geez, this feels like the most low effort game I've ranked so far. Actually, I take that back. Ninja Council 3 is still the most low effort thing I've played in this ranking, but this ain't that much better. So I'm back at ruining your childhood, telling you the games you played when you were a baby were bad, but this wouldn't be the ranking without it. If you want to watch me suffer through these games, give me a follow on Twitch. I'm live every weekday, and let's just say that day that a boss fight that you've been waiting for is coming soon. And as always, thank you very much for watching. My name's Globku, and I'll see you next time. Boy.